Greetings, Word Horde. We're here with an exciting option for you, a version of our podcast without any ads. That's right. No advertising interruptions, just the content you love, ready to go in your favorite podcast apps like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's another way to support the show, ensuring that we keep bringing you the word stories and language explorations that you love. Try it at waywardradio.org slash ad free. And it's affordable. For just a small subscription fee, you can enjoy a way with words uninterrupted, except by us. Plus, it makes a great gift. Know somebody who loves language as much as you do? Give them the gift of words. Easy to sign up, easy to enjoy. It's the same away with words, just streamlined for your listening pleasure. Go to waywardradio.org slash adfree. Support us, support the show, and enjoy an ad-free listening experience. waywardradio.org slash adfree. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. There's a game making the rounds on the Internet, and it's called If You Added ING to a Movie Title, Mm -hmm. How Would the Plot Change? Oh, boy. So, for example, Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Winding? Mm Mm-hmm. The story of what happened uh, when we all started wearing digital watch. (laughs) (laughs) Gone with the Winding. (laughs) Yeah. Or how about this one? Dude, where's my car? Turns into, dude, where's my caring? And that's about, you know, the bleakness and apathy of urban life. (laughs) Oh, no. And the great thing is that on our Facebook group, our listeners are having a field day with these. So I wanted to share some of these. Uh, This is from Baron Von Boren. He suggested the Blair Witch Project, which becomes the Blair Witch Projecting. High schooler Blair Witch reads too much into the inflection of her friend's work. <laughs> and Tom Sarve suggested Jesus Christ super staring. <laughs> this is, Jesus wins every staring contest he enters. <laughs> These are so great. Angie J. Bean. Uh, wrote the right stuffing. <laughs> there must be sage. <laughs> Julia Child special Thanksgiving <laughs> yeah. edition. <laughs> oh, you want to work? I'm not even going to do it. <laughs> and now that I've started reading these, I'm just I, I can't stop. I can't stop thinking of these. these. Every good. movie I run into, I'm, I'm adding ing to the end. And of so it. on Twitter, is there a hashtag for this so I can search and find more uh, movies I don't with know, ing? There, I bet if you dis- search, you'll find a ton of them. Probably, yeah. probably. And and there's a discussion on our Facebook page, and I will share some more Ooh. later in the. Show. Yes, please. This is a show about language and everything connected to it and some stuff that's not. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. Hit us up on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D or join our active Facebook group. Hello, you have a way with words? Hi, this is Elizabeth. I'm calling from Dallas by way of Philadelphia. By way of Philadelphia. You You're in that? two places at once? Yeah, yeah, two places at once, but my my home is in Philadelphia, but I'm here in Dallas. Okay. All right. What's on your mind? Well, I was recently listening to another call-in show, and I heard someone use the phrase, rest on our morals, which I've heard, always heard, rest on our or your laurels. And I was wondering if it's just a one-time misuse, or is it a completely different idiom? And it was really interesting because it was used in an idea of a political use, which I found really interesting. Rest on our morals? Is that what it is? Yeah. It was in the context of gun control uh, in New York City. And it was sort of like, yeah, we can't rest on our morals. Like, we can't um, just make laws based on what we feel it has to be for the greater good. At least that's how I took it. But it was such a completely, you know, out of left field thing that I've never heard before. Yeah, it's kind of creative. I mean, you're sure they said morals? Pretty sure. Uh, He had not a very strong accent, so it was pretty clear that Uh he was saying M and not L. Uh Hmm. Um, I have seen this only very, very rarely. I don't don't think it's a thing. It's usually a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I figured, that it was just a misuse, but it was such an interesting idea. I could Mm -hmm. see it being an intentional bit of wordplay. Yeah, but it sounds like they weren't using it with irony or anything like that, right? Well, rest on your laurels means just to stick with what you've already accomplished, right? I think it's like you're not supposed to just rest on 
your old accomplishments. You should always try for more. Is that right? Right, right. The the laurels there is a reference to uh, the the ancient tradition of of crowning winners with uh, wreaths made out of fragrant laurel leaves. That's that's why right. we have terms like poet laureate or Nobel laureate. It was an award for accomplishment. So if you're resting on your laurels or resting with your laurels, then you're just uh, goofing off because you've already accomplished yeah, some stuff. Yeah, I made an award-winning film in 1972. What more do you yeah. want from me? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah. So but, here, yeah. it doesn't sound like, it sounds like he might have meant the wordplay. I'd have to hear the show to know for sure. Yeah, if you hear a phrase like that, you can always go to the egg corn database Ooh, nice. on uh, okay. on the internet. That's Egg corn is, is a joking term that linguists use for uh, phrases like that, like like spreading like wildflowers instead of spreading oh, yeah, like yeah, wildfire, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and I'm looking right now, and I and I don't see that listed there. So I, I think it was a maybe a one off or a two off. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It was just it was so interesting in the context that it mm-hmm. was used that I was like, man, is this something that I've missed for all <laughs> yeah. these years? No. Or maybe something that needs to be popularized in this political season, huh? Rest on right. Rest that's, on your morals. That's exactly mean, what I thought. Would mean just because I know I'm right, I'm going to continue to do the thing I've always done. <laughs> yeah, I think that's sort of what he was saying. Like, you can't just decide what you're going to do and have that be it forever. Yeah. Hmm. You know, okay. you have to sort of take things in context. I like it. As a bit I of wordplay, I like it. I think yeah. it, I think it yeah, works. Yeah, I really liked it too. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. That's well, awesome. You may be popularizing it now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We'll keep an well, eye thank out. you so much. It was really awesome. Thank All right. Cheers guys. now. Bye-bye. Bye, Elizabeth. Bye. You know, by the way, that um, that wreath, that laurel wreath, yeah. the, the Greek word for that is Stephanos. Stephanos. Yeah. Which gives... is where we get the name Stephanie and... Stephanie and Stephen. Oh, yes. interesting. Yes, crowning those folks with uh, glory We have honor. talked about the Eggcorn database before, but we I just have. want to mention that. It's E-G-G-C-O-R-N. Mm-hmm. It's hilarious, and it's a bunch of really good-natured people mm-hmm. who run a really nice site where they just find these curiosities of language. My favorite one, favorite new one that I found, yes. it's in the database, of course, because they've yeah. got so many of them, is pine comb, C-O-M-B, instead of pine cone, C-O-N-E. Pine comb? Yeah, like a, like a comb for your hair made out of pine. Instead of cone, C O N E. Okay, and these are people who are honestly misunderstanding yeah, that. I actually, can see how that would happen. Yeah, they think it's pine cone because pine, cone. pine cones when they spread out their. Sure. I don't know they're not leaves. What are those called? Uh, kind of like the the, the seed. Uh, yeah, but anyway, they holders. have kind of like a serrated kind of edge yeah. that looks kind of like a comb. Yeah. Okay, a comb for a woolly mastodon or something. Yeah. This is a show about language and everything related to it, and some stuff that's not. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or hit us up on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Gary. Uh, I, I'm from Wiley, Texas, which is near near Dallas. Okay. Wiley. Welcome to the show. What's yeah. up? Well, thank you. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was playing golf with a buddy. And uh, we were driving up to the green, and I, and I said, there's your, there's your ball in front of the green. He said, no, it can't be my ball. I put too much mustard on it. Uh, he said, it has to be behind the green somewhere. And, and then he looked at me and said, where does that come from anyway? And I said, I don't know, but I say it too. And uh, it was interesting because he was raised in Colorado, and I was raised in West Texas. So, so it, it's uh, something that we both say, but we don't know where it comes from. Hmm. Oh, interesting there. So mustard. So you're meaning that it went really far? Uh, yes, mm-hmm. yes. And so uh, we both uh, played uh, Little League Baseball, and, and we both remember our coaches when they, when they were telling us to to throw the ball harder. They would say, hey, put some mustard on it. Uh-huh. You know. So, yeah, put a little more energy into it, basically. Uh-huh. But this I is, don't know. This yeah. is good. Yeah, we can do stuff, something with this. There is a mustard dating back to the early 1900s, a slangy term meaning... Um, as it's defined in the Historical Dictionary of American Slang, keen spirit in opposition or courage or just kind of generally used for vim or vigor or force or just like, you know, you've got a lot of mustard in your son, go get him, that sort of thing. But then by the 1970s, it's transformed fully into baseball and it means um, basically just the force on the ball. Um, there is a really mm-hmm. interesting little note, though, 
1907, there was a thesis about baseball language that was published, and the, they used a longer expression, all to the mustard, meaning good condition. So you might say, he's all to the mustard, he's ready to go, put him in coach, that sort of thing. Yeah. So we have a lot of different uh, mustards, but they all go back to mustard being the spicy condiment, and not this, not this puny, bland stuff that's artificially yellow today, but the mm-hmm. real spicy stuff, the stuff that'll make you wave your hand in front of your mouth because you're on fire. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thanks. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye, Gary. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. You wondering where a word came from? Call us, 877-929-9673, or send it to us in email. That address is words at waywardradio.org. My new favorite term today, anyway, is sneeze horn. What is a sneeze horn? Your nose. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. yeah sneeze horn. Yeah, that makes let, sense. Your schnoz. Yeah, right? Let me wipe your sneeze horn. 877 <laughs> 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 Email words at waywardradio.org. Hello. You have a way with words. Hello, Martha. This is Lee James Irwin calling from Falls Church, Virginia. Hi, Lee James. Welcome. How you doing? Just fine. Thank you. What can we do for you? Well, um, I have a question about new words. Uh, Your show is terrific in digging out the roots of words back in history, but new ones are coming up all the time. And uh, the ones I have in mind today are words that describe the intervals or or the breaks in radio programs like yours, usually a musical interlude, and then on to another segment. But I don't know what you call those things. And why have you been thinking about that? Well, I don't know, just curious. Uh, I notice, <clears throat> I listen to BBC a lot, and they don't do that, and uh, commercial radio doesn't do it so much, but a lot of uh, uh, NPR programs do. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you used one of the words that is used, interludes. Um, I can think of about five different terms for music between segments, but they all have slightly different or maybe substantially different purposes. Interludes is one. Sometimes the interlude is music that's played between segments by the national show so that the local stations can do, say, news or weather on top of that music bed or just simply replace that interlude. So if the local station doesn't doesn't um, break away from the national content, there at least will be something on the air. Um, button is one that's used a lot. Um, for the music in between segments. And I think, I'm not 100% sure this goes back to what are, are called cart machines that had these um, cartridges that looked a lot like 8-tracks that you put in yeah. them, like a stack of 4 or 6 or 12 or something, each one with a button next to them. And each one of these had a particular kind of music on it. You could just press it, and then it will play into the system. Oh. And it's a, it's a loop. It's a tape loop. So it's always ready to go as long as you haven't just played it. Oh, here I thought it was it was just fastening the segments together. <laughs> Ma'am, could be. It could be. Um, of course, we don't have zippers. Or... Another one is Stinger. But this one's, again, it's music between segments, but it tends to be... Uh, kind of an identifying music bit, like a tone, like it's like the da 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 da, something like that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Some very distinct, like of. you think, oh yeah, that's my station. I recognize that. That's their. That's the little tones that they play. Um, bumper music. Mm-hmm. This is typically though a music bed underneath, say a commercial or an underwriter credit or or something like that. Um, one more here. I think I guess that's it. Oh, bridge. Some people use bridge, just like they borrowed from the. Music itself, you know, a bridge connects two parts of a song. In this case, a bridge connects two parts of a show. So it's stingers and zippers and bumps, oh my. Well, <laughs> yeah, no zippers. I don't have a zipper in there. But button will be I threw that in, in there. public radio. I believe that's the one that most people use is button. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, now I know more than I did uh, this morning. I thank you very kindly. <laughs> right on. Our pleasure. Happy to help. Thanks, Lee James. All right. So long. Take care. Call us with your language question, 877-929-9673. You can also email us. That address is words at waywardradio.org. Stay tuned as we take more questions about language from you as Away With Words continues. Hey, we've got something special for those of you who love our show but could do without the ads. That's right. Imagine away with words, the same engaging conversations, the same deep dives into language without advertising interruptions. 
We're talking about our ad-free podcast feed. It's sleek, clean, and it's just for our supporters. It's at waywardradio.org slash ad-free. It's inexpensive, easy to sign up for, and works with all major podcast apps like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's an affordable way to support the show and get a seamless listening experience. And if you're feeling generous, why not give a subscription to another Away With Words fan? That's waywardradio.org slash adfree. Sign up today. Your support means the world. waywardradio.org slash adfree. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. And joining us now is our quiz guy, John Chinesky. Hiya, John. Hey, bud. What's up? Hey, Martha. Hey, Grant. Uh, things are doing are going great here. You know, I'm in New York, one of the greatest cities in the world. I really wish I could go see more theater. Okay. I can't afford to go anymore, but I can certainly imagine how much fun it might be. For example, there's that show... I think it's a musical adaptation of Priscilla Presley's autobiography. What's that show again? I have no idea. Oh, I'm I'm trying to figure out this setup, Martha. Yeah, I know. What is her autobiography called? Oh, it's got to have something with Elvis. Yeah. Um, Elvis lives. No, it's a famous oh. show. Everybody, it's, it's oh. been f- around um, for many, many years. But it must be about uh, about Elvis and Priscilla, right? Oh, that's right. It's called The King and I. Oh. That's, that's what it is. That's that show. Oh, I yeah. see where we're going. That must with be this. a great show. Got it. I, I love his Got music. It. There's our premise. Uh, there's a show going on right now. I'm I'm pretty sure it's about the Department of Geological Sciences at some university. I guess. School of Rock. Yeah, that's it. School of Rock. That's uh, it. Sounds like it'd be pretty dry to me, but you know, they make musicals out of anything these days. Um, how about this one? There's a show about young upstart employees at a sportswear manufacturing company. I guess they like different teams or whatnot. There's got to be some conflict in there somewhere. Guys who work at a sportswear manufacturing company. Uh, they make shirts. They make shirts. Yeah. Hmm. The Milner's Jersey guys. Boys. Jersey yes, Boys. That's them. Nice. The Jersey Boys. <laughs> Very good. There's a show about the internet and email, and this guy, he gets a lot of ads because he clicks on the wrong thing. It's sort of a cautionary tale. Bad links. <laughs> um, um, let, spam a lot. Yes, mm, spam a lot is spam-a-lot. correct. Very good. Um, there's this show about a guy. He like he falls in love with a girl who works at a carnival, and he tells us all about her, but, but it's not carnival. My Fair Lady. Yes, My Fair oh. Lady. Very good, Grant. <laughs> One of the best ones of all time, by the Very way. good. Um, how about a show about California, Oregon, and Washington, and how that whole part of the U.S. got settled? It's quite an interesting tale. How it all got settled. Um, wagons Ho, um, Painted Wagon, mm-hmm. um, How the West Was West Won. Coast. Ooh, well, there's one word. <laughs> west. Is it West? Yeah. Side. Story. Yeah. West Side Story. <laughs> yes, West Side Story. <laughs> Nicely done. All right. Ever since that musical about cats, I've enjoyed anthropomorphic beasts, like the ones that must be in that show about the bears and their hibernation every year, and they sing and dance and whatever. Bears? <laughs> and they sing and dance? Singing yeah. and dancing bears. Thinking of Phil Harris well, singing bears. Technically, it's about in the any book. animal that hibernates. And what Spring happens? Spring awakening. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Very nice, Martha. Nice. She pulled that one out. All right, these last two are very weird. Um, okay. There's a show, it's a musical, I think it's about candles. Um, the Spark? Wicked? Wick? Yeah, oh, well, that's Wick. the show. Oh. Yeah, Wicked. <laughs> Dude. Finally, this has got to be the weirdest show ever. You walk in, and the curtain goes up, and there's another curtain right behind it, but it's been torn in two, and it just stays that way for two hours. No intermission. Rent. Yes, rent. <laughs> Nicely done, Martha. Okay. Martha is on top of it. A game for Martha, you right? Guys certainly got up to speed. Cool, John. Thank you for enlightening us. I got on a list of shows I need to go see you next time I'm in New York. Thank you, guys. I'll see you on the aisle. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. We want to hear from you, so call us, 877-929-9673, or send an email to words at waywardradio.org. Tweet us at wayward and find us on Facebook. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello, 
This is Martha Wild from uh, San Diego. Hi, Martha. How you doing? Martha Wild. Two Marthas. <laughs> Two <Yes>. Wild Marthas. <laughs> Two Wild Marthas. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the show. What can we do for you, Martha? Well, I have a question that has to do with a large controversy that's happening in a group that I'm part of. So oh, boy. I, I do a lot of English country dance, um, contra dance, and I've done Morris dance. And there's a move, there's a dance move that we've used for years, and it's been used for hundreds of years, as far as we can tell. And the move is called a gypsy, um, where you walk around the other person. You look at them and you walk around them. Okay? Mm-hmm. And it, it, in Morris dancing, they, actually, they usually call it a half jip or a whole jip if you go all the way around. I belong to a group. I, I, I call the dances some of the, some of the contra dances, and we we have a, a shared list on the internet. And one of the callers wrote in and said that he'd been approached after one of the dances by a new dancer that had come in and said how much they enjoyed the dancing and what a great group they had, but they couldn't believe they were using this terrible ethnic slur, gypsy, to refer to this dance move. And so this caused this whole huge controversy in our group about whether we should completely drop this word because it's an ethnic slur to the Romani. And I have to say that the person who brought this up was not Roma. It was somebody else um, who had heard it, I guess, somewhere. And then this other group that says, but wait, you know, we don't even know the provenance of this term. Maybe it comes from a different origin. And someone looked into it and said that in Welsh, jip means to glance at someone, and it may have come from that originally, especially since Morris dancing is close the Cotswolds are close to the Welsh border. I don't want to be, you know, culturally insensitive and be, you know, promoting a, a word that's an ethnic slur. But on the other hand, I also don't want to get rid of, you know, over 100 years of using a term that may be completely innocent. I thought I would ask the word mavens what their feeling was about this sort of difficult situation. Oh, boy. Wow. And, Martha, are the two sides pretty evenly divided? It seems about so. There's a, there's a very large contingent that is com- coming up with other words like gimbal and, and gyre and, um, <laughs> and, and walk wave. around to, to completely avoid the word. Um, but on the other hand, you have to explain it every time to the people who already know what the move is and have to train them to a new, a new word. Right. And, and, of course, everybody's using different words, so it's for the ones that are changing over and are being totally PC. And then there's the other group that says, no, we're not going to change. So, and, and, there's, and there's a lot of vitriol going on. Yeah, I can wow. imagine. Yeah. And so for the people who, um, who oppose it, would, would etymology be key? I mean, if you could definitively say that this word, gyp or gypsy, doesn't come from or isn't associated uh, with that ethnic group, would that make a difference, you think? I think it would for some. I think for some it wouldn't. For some, they Mm -hmm. don't want to say a word that might be misconstrued and misinterpreted by other people. Um, On the other hand, it's not as if we have a huge Roma population. I mean, I've been using this word for 30 or 40 years, and I've never had anyone say boo about it. So Mm -hmm. I don't think most people that we deal with have a negative connotation in their mind about it. Mm -hmm. Um, But so, And for some people, I think that if it had a different etymology, they'd say, this has a different etymology, and therefore it is an innocent word, and it's just two words that are similar to each other, too bad. Right. So, yeah. Let's, uh, I think I'd be more, uh, one of those people. <laughs> let's uh, clear some of this away as a distraction for a moment. Uh, it, the the jip here does not come from Welsh. There is a word meaning something like look or glance in Welsh, but it probably would be pronounced geep. My Welsh is terrible, but this is what I've been told. And we do have a strong etymological connection between jip and gypsy going back to the Romani people. So oh, it's okay. it's the, the Welsh thing is just somebody looking for an easy out, and it's not a path to be taken. It's just a okay. superficial similarity that should be ignored. The other thing here is we have strong... In this industry, and you may know more about this than we do, there's a strong understanding that this type of dancing could actually come from the Romani people. Uh, Morris dance in particular has some substantial evidence that suggests it was borrowed into um, the British culture from the travelers. This is all distractions here. The real interesting thing here for us is what can you do to make the half of the people who are unhappy happy? I don't know, because if everyone changed the word and picked a word yeah. that was new, I think the half that wants to be PC would be happy, but I don't think the half that 
had right. to change all their dances and rewrite everything and, and watch their language constantly and not, not say the word they're used to would be happy. Yeah, it sounds like you're in a difficult bind here because I don't see an out. Uh, somebody's going to go away unhappy here. <laughs> the thing is, it does come yeah. from, and, and my understanding is, and there's a there are better authorities than me on the internet, but the, all the evidence, the print evidence, suggests that even though the dance moves themselves date back to the 1600s at least, the term itself mm-hmm. is relatively new, dating from perhaps mm-hmm. the early 1900s. And so mm-hmm. that's really interesting. Another interesting thing about it is we we do see Jip and Gypsy used interchangeably in early documents showing these dance moves, which, again, forget, this allows us to ignore the Welsh connection. The third thing is, do you feel that this term Gypsy is pejorative? Well, it turns out the Romany do. They don't mm-hmm. use this term for themselves. And actually, most of the places in English where Gyp or Gypsy is used are negative or pejorative or insulting mm-hmm. or intentionally meant to describe something that is bad or terrible. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. The, the American Heritage Dictionary describes it as often offensive. Often, yeah. Often. I had never realized that it had a, a, a really negative context. There are place names in North America, in Canada, the United States, mm-hmm. mountains or, or features of geography which have very pejorative, such as the N-word, as part of their names. And mm-hmm. these, so it will so be N-word peak or N-word river or what have you, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. We, or squaw. And, and, or squaw. Squaw is another one. We mm-hmm. universe, Almost universally, people understand that these terms need to be changed or simply not used, mm-hmm. even though they're just referring to a mountain. Even though they're not meant to directly insult a people, even though they're right. not meant to hurt feelings, right? right? We know at least all well-educated, forward-thinking, kind of considerate, sensitive human beings think this, right? Mm. And when we mm-hmm. look in Gypsy and Gypsy in this dancing, I think I see a strong comparison here. There, I think even though it's difficult to change the name, you should. Mm-hmm. And I know that okay. I know that you can't change it in all the dancing all across the, the United States and the English speaking world. I know you can't, but at least among your peer group, you might you might come up with something. Even if it's just a shortening like G or or um, something similar. Uh, so yeah. jazz or I don't know, just something sim- relatively similar, but it is clearly not that word. I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think I'm on the same page as, as Grant here, Martha. I mean, it's a really mm-hmm. tough one. You know, the more you read about the history. Of mm-hmm. the Romani people and the the oppression and uh, and prejudice and and right. uh, maltreatment. Uh, it, do, are you giving up that much if you give up that word? What about the hundreds of years of dance before? What did they call it then? Ooh. Maybe oh. you can go back to the earlier term, and that would satisfy some people who want to know that it's not strictly um, out of sensitivity that you're doing it. It's a reach mm-hmm. back to the roots. Because as you probably know, this is a, it's a, re- a revived tradition anyway. It's, not, you know, it's brought back from ancient manuals, and a lot of stuff was amended and added in the 1970s and kind of even fabricated just to make it look authentically historic when it's not necessarily so. Yeah. Well, Martha, it sounds like this is going to go on for a while. Maybe you can take our thoughts back to the group and see what they think. Oh, definitely, definitely. And and, and, uh, I think you've persuaded me. Um, I wanted your I wanted your moral compass on this. Okay. (laughs) Martha, let us know how this goes. Okay. Okay, I will. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, we do. We do want to know. Keep keep us updated. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. You know, we know that you listening have an opinion on this and bring us your best information. Tell us what you think. Should they drop the term? Can you think of suggestions they can use instead of Jip or Gypsy? Do you think that it's offensive or no? 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. Another entry for the game, if you added ING to a movie title, how would the plot change? Yeah. Uh, This one on our Facebook group comes from Sandra Churchwell Voss O'Brien. She suggested adding ING to Aaron Brockovich. Aaron Brockoviching? Brockoviching? Brockoviching. Brockoviching. So she's complaining? Right, an Irish lady complaining. (laughs) Aaron Brockoviching. I thought that was brilliant. Okay, Aaron Brockovich. I wonder if you can do that to a lot of other people's names. Let's see. Yeah, it doesn't work for very Verity, many other names. Barnett, no, no, no. no. <laughs> a few. Send us your movie titles, words at waywardradio.org, or find us on Twitter. Our handle is wayward. Hello, you have a way with words. Uh, hi, this is uh, Gary from Wethersfield. I've been listening to your show for 
probably more years than I want to admit, but this is the first time I'm calling in. <laughs> well, bless your heart. And where is this place? Weathersfield, Connecticut. Oh, okay. Connecticut. All right. Welcome to the show, Gary. How can we help? Okay. I've always wondered about the use of the word late, as in the late David Bowie. I've heard the late John F. Kennedy and even the late Abraham Lincoln. But, I've, you know, what about the late Cleopatra? Is there a time limit on this? Mm. <laughs> the late Cleopatra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no hard and fast rule for that, Gary. And I've seen all kinds of uh, suggestions. Some people have said in the past uh, that that 30 years should be the 30 years the outside. But but then more and more, you know, as time goes on, I see that people suggest even shorter periods of time, like 15 years. I think William Sapphire suggested mm -hmm. uh, 15 to 30 when he was alive. Um, the late William Sapphire. The late, well, yeah. I mean, that's a good question. How long ago did he die? That's been less than 10 years, I think. Yeah. How so long ago the late John F. Kennedy? No. I mean, you might use the late John F. Kennedy if you were talking um, in a historical context. If you said something like uh, the Civil Rights uh, Act was passed in honor of the late John F. Kennedy because it was close to mm. that time, right, 1964. My favorite recommendation comes from Brian Garner, um, who writes a lot about usage, and he suggests just five years, that after that, it's not really that relevant. It's it's short for lately deceased. That's mm -hmm. that's the point. That's the clarification oh, there. Okay. And that's a, you've touched upon ah. something that has always been in my mind when you said that John F. Kennedy, the late John F. Kennedy, blah, 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 Civil Rights Act. To me, the late has always suggested that there might be some doubt in the listeners or the reader's mind as to whether or not the person was dead mm -hmm. at the time you were talking or the time you were talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's so you useful. specify the late. Like you may not have known that William Sapphire was dead. So saying the late William Sapphire will clue you in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after a certain point, we all know that. Yeah, that somebody is, yeah. is dead, but but the late Cleopatra, the, you'd only say that as a joke, and Martha and I both yeah. laughed or snickered when you said that because we recognized that as an inaccurate usage, right? Yeah, she's extremely right. late. <laughs> um, but you know, another point about this is that it's a it's a gesture of respect as well. It's a term of respect. You know, you wouldn't necessarily talk about the late terrorist, for example. Right. Oh, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. hmm, interesting. I once used the term. The late Gilgamesh. <laughs> and I you had did. only one person in the crowd react to it. <laughs> and, and what was their reaction, Gary? Oh, it's just a raised eyebrow. We chuckled a little bit about it. Yeah. yeah. I, I thought think maybe the other people didn't know who Gilgamesh was. Oh. <laughs> I thought maybe they pumped their fist in the air to say, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> yes. Down with Gilgamesh. <laughs> yeah, so is that helpful, Gary? I mean, no hard and fast rule, yeah, but... Um... Yeah, no, very good. Oh, well, good. Well, good. We're glad we could help. Thanks, Gary. Very good. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Bye. bye bye. Eight seven seven nine two nine nine six seven three. We were talking earlier about the game of adding ing to movie titles. On our Facebook group, Michael D. Britton suggested a couple of work-related ones. Uh, you add ing to the movie network. Networking. Networking. It's a LinkedIn special. Or um, Strangers on a Train. Strangers on a Training. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do corporate professionals discover love in an all-day seminar? <laughs> Strangers on a Training. Send us your movie titles with ING added to change the plot. Words at waywardradio.org. Or you can call us with one. The number is 877-929-9673. More conversation about what we say and how we say it. Stick around. Got a minute? We need your help. Head over to gum.fm slash words and share your thoughts in our quick survey. 
Your feedback matters. It's the backbone of our show's success. Thanks for making our show even more successful. That's G-U-M dot F-M slash W-O-R-D-S. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. In the early 1900s, a guy named Grenville Kleiser was an instructor in public speaking at Yale Divinity School, and he wrote a whole bunch of books on elocution, better speaking, better writing, uh, how to win an argument, that kind of thing. And one of his books was called 15,000 Useful Phrases. Oh, boy which is a pretty daunting title in and of itself. And I didn't count them all, but they're probably about that many and sort of consistent with education in those days. Uh, The book offered all of these models for people to imitate. He encourages people in the book to take these phrases and say them aloud, read them aloud, write them out in order to become better writers. And he's got a whole chapter on similes, striking similes, and they're all gathered from some of the best poets and writers of the day. And what I found in looking at an entire chapter of similes was that there's sort of a fine line between genius when it comes to simile and and similes that are completely dreadful. Okay. And you've got examples of both. I do. Uh, how about this? My head was like a great bronze bell with one thought for the clapper. <laughs> I love it. Was that what you do? Bad, was that your bad one? Uh, yeah, that one. <laughs> I love that one. Do you? That's outstanding. <laughs> I like absurd things like that. Well, I do What's too. the good one? Let's hear the good well, one. A good one. I bet I hate it. Okay. I like this one. Okay. Like a summer dried fountain. Oh, that's nice. That reminds me of one that I wanted to share with you. Okay. To mourn like the pines on an autumn night. Oh, right? I like that very much. Right. Can you, can you, hear the, you can hear the murmur of the pines in the dark, right? I like that very much. Yeah. So what makes a good one and what makes a bad one? That's, that's what I've been wrestling yeah. with. For me, it's always been a little bit like poetry. We've talked about this before. Yes where I think that life experience informs poetry, and poetry is more mm-hmm. interesting the older you are. Mm-hmm. And perhaps it's the same for similes and metaphor and that sort of thing, those other figures of speech. Just a little more knowledge of life in general leads you to understand the implications, connotations, and denotations of, of a particular turn of phrase. Really? You mean so when we're younger, we, we appreciate No, we appreciate them are, less. Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. appreciate them less. Like when we're younger, we might be more impressed uh, by one like, incredible little white teeth like snow shut in a rose. Maybe. Or how about this one? <laughs> Moody as a poet. I like Moody as a poet. <laughs> but it's really straightforward. There's no art to it, right? Well, I, th- I think some of the ones that are that are more elaborate... Um, are the ones that I find the most irritating. You know, something like, he snatched furiously at breath like a tiger snatching at meat. Yeah, that's going to fail the writing contest pretty much. Yeah, yeah, but th- but then this one, like stepping out on summer evenings from the glaring ballroom. There's something so sensuous about that well, and I simple. That three of the ones we liked have to do with seasons. Seasons. Seasons, like summer. Oh, yeah, interesting. Autumn. Well, we want to hear the similes that catch your ear. Call us 877-929-9673 or let us know what makes a good simile in email. The address is words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Tom. Hi, Tom. Where are you calling from? Hey, I'm calling from Anderson, Indiana. Anderson, Indiana. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hey, Tom. What's up? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, It's good to talk to both of you. My pleasure. I've got a simple question. Um, I've always used the phrase... Uh, in a nutshell, and I was just kind of curious about um, if this is a thing that's here locally in the United States or if it's a global phrase, uh, where did it originate from? I was just kind of curious about that. So you use it when what? When you're explaining something simply? Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're if you're talking to somebody and uh, um, I, I don't know, you're just talking about something specific and they they say yeah yeah that's basically it they'll agree with you and say basically you got it in a nutshell that's that's basically it in a nutshell gotcha i use it all the time but i just never really um had any idea of the origin uh i figured you guys would know yeah we do this is a really really clear etymology it goes all the way back to antiquity as a matter of fact 
Um, the Roman, really? Yeah, yeah. The Roman historian Pliny, who died in 79 A.D. Uh, with the uh, eruption of Mount Vesuvius, writes that Cicero, um, the orator, claimed that the entire Iliad, Homer's Iliad, uh, was once written on pieces of parchment and put into a nutshell. That that it was that small, this manuscript. So there, there's a reference to, to a manuscript that's absolutely tiny and could fit into a nutshell. What kind of nut are we talking that's about? That's so amazing. I had no idea that that was... <laughs> that's really, really amazing. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah, probably a, a walnut. Something like that. Because it's, yeah. if it's in a coconut, it's not that, it's not that amazing, right? Right, yeah. right. But, yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, supposedly, this has got to be tiny, tiny writing, because supposedly uh, the Iliad itself contains over 501,000 Greek letters. Boy. So wow. that's going to be either really tiny writing or a really big nut. Right, and so then, yeah. so then you see this in um, in English, like all the way back to uh, the late sixteenth century, people talking about an Iliad in a nutshell. And the phrase uh, after that was, I'll give you an Iliad in a nutshell or something like that. And eventually it was shortened to, <laughs> it was put into a nutshell. It was shortened into in a nutshell. So the, the, the context or the meaning behind it has actually changed over time then. Yeah, it went from being just that one particular work being made so small as to fit into the tiny quarters of a nutshell to being anything made short or brief so that it could um, figuratively fit into a nutshell. That's really amazing. Yeah, and, right? Uh, the roots, the yeah, roots of what we speak. Yeah, it's really odd. We have a lot of little phrases and sayings that I guess we kind of take for granted that um, we use them, but maybe we really don't know the real meaning behind them. Tom, you got that right. That you put it in a nutshell. That is exactly what this <laughs> yeah. show tries that's to do. That's <laughs> what we're all about, for sure. Thanks, yeah, thanks man. Right. Appreciate the call. Hey, thank you very much. Take care now. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. For a moment of linguistic kind of joy, the fact that we can actually trace this one I know. to its roots. Because it's usually it's like, um, I don't know, but yeah. I think and this one Some we have Some say, it. others say. Yeah, this one's pretty clear. Yeah. Not much doubt here. And Shakespeare used it that way uh, in yeah. Hamlet. And he's the great popularizer. Yeah, in a nutshell. In a nutshell. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. Talk to us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. And join our active Facebook group where there are thousands of people talking about words and language. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Mary, and I'm calling from Kenai, Alaska. Um, I adopted four African-American girls several years ago. And then one of my daughters went on to have a baby. And I was combing my granddaughter's hair one day, and she said to me, don't mess with my kitchen. And I said, what do you mean your kitchen? And then she pointed to the back of her hair where the nape of her hair hits the top of her neck. And I was like, what does that mean? And she couldn't tell me. And I'm sure my daughters got it from one of their mothers of their friends. Yeah. So um, I was just wondering what that meant and where did it come from? Um, so are you all from Alaska originally or do you hail from somewhere else? What are the what are we talking about here in terms of migration patterns well, and geography? Well, I have been in Alaska for over 40 years. Um, my kids are all adopted. They're from various – most of my daughters are born and raised in Alaska. Um, but the only thing I can account it to is that they do have friends. Yeah whose parents come from the South, mm. uh-huh. and it's possible that they, you know, that I'm, I'm sure that's where it came from. I'm sure my daughters had friends, and their moms were combing their daughter's hair, and then somehow my daughters picked it up, and my oldest daughter then said it to my granddaughter. So it was the mm-hmm. hair or the neck or both together? It's the hair and the neck. It's mostly the hair and okay. the nape of the neck. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is an African-American term for sure, mostly common. I mean, uh, white Southern Americans will also use it. The Dictionary of American Regional English has some citations for it going back to the 1970s, but the earlier roots for it are even more interesting to me and that they come from the Scots language. Mm-hmm. So we have those back to at least the 1830s. But in that particular case, it refers to like a twist of rope or a knot in a string or anything that's like kind of twisted together, very mm-hmm. much like you would do with a braid or certain hairstyles at the back of the neck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that word is, is kinch, right? Yeah, kinch, yeah. Yeah, and it means sort of a kink. Oh, kinch. A kinch, yeah. Mm-hmm, right. And so um, clearly when we have a great long history of the Scots language influencing American English, especially in the American South, and I'm sure that that's right, the yeah. etymological origin for that. 
Well, well that does, I, I guess it surprises me that it comes from all that far back. Yeah. But knowing that they moved into that area doesn't surprise me. And yeah, so it, it has is, nothing to do with kitchen? No, it doesn't <laughs> no. seem to have anything to do with kitchen. No, it's just a coincidence that they sound the same. There's a lot of those kinds of coincidences in language. Mm -hmm. But um, you hit upon, mm -hmm. like I said, a perfect part of it. It's very strongly tied to African-American language in the United States. It's not all that common among white American English speakers. It might be reinforced by the use of hot irons. I've heard that yeah. as a false etymology. You know, that, oh, that it's like, you know, the kitchen is hot and you're using a hot iron back in that area. But it's not actually the origin. It's oh, just the, correct. kind of a false support <laughs> yeah. of it. Yeah. So there you go. That's the that's well, the best we can do. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I had no idea where it came from. <laughs> All right. Thanks for calling. All right. Thank you. Take care now. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye-bye. 877 is the number to call to talk with us about language. You can also email us. That address is words at waywardradio.org. Grant, I want to share some more similes from this book, 15,000 Useful Phrases by Grenville Kleiser. Okay. Like footsteps upon wool. I really like that one. Footsteps, that's oh, that's nice. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, you tread lightly. Yeah. Or what about this one? Quaking and quivering like a short-haired puppy after a ducking. After I can just see that little puppy. Oh, after, yeah. You know, after yeah, I can see that too. That's right? nice. Or what about the sky was like a peach? Does that work for you? The, the sky, sky was, was like a peach? The sky was like a peach. Yeah, I think it does. does it depends it? on the... I, for some of these require... I want to know more about the scene and the author and what else I know. But some of them do their own work, like tiny bits of poetry. Exactly. And, and that's one of the reasons that I've been enjoying going through this book. Well, we'd love to hear your similes, 877-929-9673, or send them an email to words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello, Grant and Martha. My name is Robin, and I bring greetings from Madison, Wisconsin. Hi, hey, Robin. Robin. We accept your greetings Thank from you Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. From all of Madison? That is the most formal introduction. From the entire we've ever... city. <laughs> oh, wow. nice. I want the golden key. <laughs> We'd <laughs> like to get over there soon. <laughs> What's up, Robin? How can we help? Well, I am calling because uh, I would like to know the genesis of the expression to throw your hat in the room ahead of you. I believe I grew up knowing this expression. I don't remember my parents ever using it. It's just something that I must have just known from uh, popular culture. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in southern Ohio, and so that is my question. And how would you use that? Yeah, what does it mean? Well, the reason uh, that I uh, began thinking about this is that I uh, have a small habit of uh, buying things or making small home renovation projects uh, and surprising my husband with them. And on uh -huh. an occasion recently, I uh, had a new uh, oven and cooktop uh, put in the kitchen. And uh, the day that it was installed, I was out. And when I came home, my husband was home ahead of me. So I came in the house. And I took a hat and I threw it in the room where he was sitting. And he asked me why I was throwing things at him. <laughs> <laughs> and so I proceeded to uh, try and explain, uh, you know, the expression throwing your hat in the room ahead of you. And he was just, he just looked at me very blankly and said, oh, well, it must be another one of those Appalachian things. <laughs> since that is the area where I grew up. So, so you threw um, the hat into the room. Why exactly? Well, um, I understood the expression to throw your hat in the room ahead of you was to see if anyone shot at it. So <laughs> it was what? just uh, trying to be certain uh, that there wasn't an imminent attack about to happen. Is it safe to enter, with a basically? Western, I don't know why, but that's yeah. <laughs> how I've always associated it in my head, mm -hmm. um, was to throw your throw a hat in to see if it was uh, shot at. Okay. Mm. Well, as far as I can tell, it's not regional. But okay. if you were reading the newspapers in 1983, you might have heard mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan say it to Margaret Thatcher. 
or something like it. <laughs> Actually, it didn't come to light until many years later. It turns out that there was a period when, uh, if you remember, the United States invaded Grenada. Uh-huh. And he wasn't sure, Ronald Reagan wasn't sure how the U.K. would handle it. And so he is quoted uh-huh. in some, some transcripts that came to light later. I'm reading something from the BBC here. It says, the president phoned Lady Thatcher to explain the action he'd take it. And he says, if I were there, Margaret, I'd throw my hat in the door before I came in. Um, and mm. she says, there's no need for that. And he meant he wasn't sure what she would think about the U.S. invading this country without telling the U.K. first. But it's not the earliest use I know of. I actually found one in a biography of Harry Houdini from 1931. The author is J.C. Connell. And this biography was a huge hit at the time, widely republished. Even now, sometimes it's reprinted. And in there, it said that Mr. and Mrs. Houdini fought so much that, well, one of the things it says is that um, when they were with company, he would raise his right eyebrow three times as a signal for his wife to stop talking. And then the other, <laughs> and, the, and the other things that it says, if she became angry, he would leave the house, walk around for a while, and then when he returned, he would throw his hat into the room. If it were thrown back out, he would take another short walk and repeat the hat throwing <laughs> when he came back. And so I don't oh, well, know that... we may become known as Mr. and Mrs. Houdini then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know that that's the origin, but certainly it was a bestseller for the time. It's really difficult to search for this. But if you do, you will find this hat throwing described in a number of uh, biographies, amateur biographies that people have written about their grandparents or their great-grandparents, most of them mm-hmm. dating to the early 1900s. And in their family lore, apparently their grandparents or gra- great-grandparents went through this same ritual of one of them, the husband testing whether the wife was angry at him by tossing his hat into the room. So there's some precedence for this. But it doesn't, it's not particularly Appalachian at all. Oh, good. (laughs) Good. Well, that's that's very uh, interesting. I thought maybe you were going to say that it was in one of Ronald Reagan's movies. (laughs) Oh, you know, it could have been. I wouldn't be surprised. quoting from. Yeah, he did so many old Western flicks. Uh, maybe we'll have to have a movie fest and see. And I'm assuming that, that metaphorically your husband didn't throw the hat back out. I mean, a new oven and hey. <laughs> well, you know, actually it took him over 24 hours to even notice it. So <laughs> <laughs> you it turns keep... out he hadn't even seen it and he didn't know what was going on. You should so... keep upping your game and like build another story onto yeah. the house and see if he notices. <laughs> <laughs> New car in the driveway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Robin, thank you very much. You are so welcome. I look forward to listening to your program Aww. every week. Nice. And thank you so much for bringing it to the air. Our oh, pleasure. Thank you, Robin. Cheers now. Take care. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, if a word or phrase has you stumped, call us at 877-929-9673 or send an email to words at waywardradio.org. And we are all over Facebook and Twitter. Do you want more Away With Words? Listen to years of past episodes at waywardradio.org or find the shows in any podcast app or on iTunes. The toll-free line is always open, so leave a message for us at 877-929-9673. We love to get your emails at words at waywardradio.org or you can hit us up on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D and look for us on Facebook. This program would not be possible without you. Grant and I are out to change the way we listen to each other and the way we think about language. And you're making it happen. Thanks also to senior producer Stephanie Levine, director Colin Tedeschi, and editor Tim Felton in San Diego. In New York, we thank production wizard James Ramsey, quiz guide John Chinesky, and that master of keeping it real, Paul Ruist at Argo Studios. Away With Words is an independent production of Wayward, Inc. From the Recording Arts Center at Studio West in San Diego, I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Bye-bye. So long. Hey, listeners, we have a favor to ask. We'd love for you to fill out our listener survey at gum.fm slash words. Your feedback is crucial. It's quick, and it helps us make our show even better. It shapes our show, helps us plan, and ensures we're bringing you the content you love. That's gum.fm slash words. Thanks for being a part of what we do. Thank you.